they don't realize that this is probably the reason why they're unable to get that loan. Because wow. the business on paper doesn't show that you make enough. This is Blair Durham with Black Wall Street Today, your media hub for all things black entrepreneurship, politics, news, and events in Hampton Roads and beyond. When I say black, y'all say Wall Street. Black. Wall Street. Black Wall Street. When I say black, y'all say Wall Street. Black. Black. I invite you to engage with us online via Facebook and Instagram at Black Wall Street Today and via Twitter at BWS Today. Interested in being featured on our show? Well, visit us at www.blackwallstreet.today and submit your request. Feel free to email me as well at Blair at blackbrand.biz. According to Forbes Women, Google is taking steps to ensure the black community has a seat at the tech table. Daria Green, Google's global manager of external community affairs, says the new program is designed to ensure that entrepreneurs are equipped to grapple with the world of digital marketing. The program presently serves 15,000 plus U.S. based diverse small businesses with eight coaches in markets including Atlanta, Austin, Chicago, D.C., Detroit, L.A., Miami and of course, New York City. And they've employed local entrepreneurs to make that happen. Answering questions about funding options and Google Analytics and everything in between, these individuals comprise the all-new Google Digital Coaches Program. I invite you to partner with Google. Google has also partnered with the nation's oldest trade association for Black businesses, the National Business League, or the NBO. Ken Harris, president of the NBL, founded by Booker T. Washington in 1900, says black businesses have a large technology gap that has to be closed. He says a deal between Google and the organization will bring to the marketplace opportunities for black entrepreneurs who've been disproportionately isolated, marginalized or disconnected from resources to grow and position themselves for the future. Leaders believe the effort is vital to the development of black businesses, supporting current and future African-American entrepreneurs. So what are the benefits? NBL member businesses will get a free website, domain name, and email address along with search engine optimization gadgets. Plus, they'll have full access to Google's cloud-based G Suite, including Gmail, Docs, Calendar, and other services. Non-NBL members can get the services for free by becoming members of the NBL. The new program was kicked off in late November in Detroit, where the NBL is based. It will be launched to regional hubs in Atlanta, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C. in early 2019 and expanded to over 365 of the trade group's business leagues nationally and internationally by 2020. Harris says the NBL now has over 15,000 members, but its goal is to boost that to 1 million with the aid of the Google Partnership. The NBL and Google aim to reach the 2.9 million Black-owned businesses nationally, of which Harris says 90% have one to five employees. But many of those firms don't have the technology infrastructure needed to sufficiently grow. The partnership will allow them to reach new markets and help companies diversify into new industries and sectors. Harris says they will become stronger competitors locally, nationally, and through import and export abroad. Chris Gentile, who is Google's Director of Community and Business Inclusion, said to the Detroit News that Google's mission is to organize, of course, the world's information, making it usable and accessible. He says, quote, we can't get there without the black community, period. He added that the partnership will connect businesses with Google's products and provide opportunities for them to explore supplier partnerships as well. Our focus for today is managing your money and building wealth. Imagine that. Our very first guest is Miss Falasha Day Ayabusi. She hails from Largo, Maryland, where she works as an accountant, insurance broker, speaker, and small business growth strategist. She's also a wife, a mother, and an entrepreneur. She's helped entrepreneurs and small business owners save over $25 million in lost <coughs> revenue, tax assessments, penalties, and interest over the last 12 months alone. I'm very confident in uh, her services, and I'm super excited to speak with you on the line today. How are you, Felicia Day? Hey, Blair. How are you? I'm awesome. It's great to have you. Welcome to the show. Yes, no, thank you for having me. I appreciate this opportunity. Awesome. Well, you know, everybody is teaching financial literacy. So many different spins. Everybody has a piece. Tell me, what makes you unique? Tell us your story. Okay. 
So what makes me unique is first I realized that um, so many entrepreneurs just jump out there thinking that it's just so easy without a blueprint. So as an accountant to entrepreneurs, I realized that I have to give them that sweet spot. I have to give them that sweet spot, that sweet spot in between having the numbers, building the business, and being realistic, honest, and holding them accountable. So I've realized that I need to connect accounting, entrepreneurship, and their lifestyle glare all into one for them to achieve the lifestyle and the business goals that they desire. I got it. So I I think what I'm hearing you say is you have simplified things for entrepreneurs um, by kind of filling that gap in terms of the numbers. Is that it? Exactly. Yes. How did you get into this particular? Go ahead. And made it fun as well and more interesting than how it just normally, you know, proceeds. Um, I'm trying to put a spin to. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how did you get into this work? I mean, was this something that, you know, when you were a little girl, you knew this is what you wanted to do? Or how did this thing kind of evolve? Oh, well, to be honest with you, Blair, I'm a second generation accountant, so I have to give kudos to my dad. Awesome. Um, he exposed me um, to what accounting really was and the importance of it. Mm-hmm. And I grew up in Washington, D.C., um, Northeast Blair, and it you know, we had a lot of um, hardworking baby boomers um, in our community, but we didn't have any businesses or no way to retain the wealth that we've been collecting or making in our nine to five. So I'm sitting back and I'm like, okay, my dad is in, you know, Maryland doing people's taxes. All I hear is, you know, I get a tax refund, go to H and R Block. It has to be a better way to this. It has to be. Um, a, a, a much more streamlined or more reason behind why our people are standing in line for three or four hours at a time to get their taxes filed. So I instantly became intrigued on how um, devoted people were to just get their taxes filed. Wow. Hmm. And so you have some pretty impressive statistics as well, Felicia Day, in terms of the number of clients you have and how it is that you've helped them. To what other factors do you attribute your success, would you say? So I got it. You're making it fun. Obviously, you're very passionate. Um, you know, how is it that you've been able to experience this kind of growth? Um, Well, I actually experienced this type of growth by learning from my own experiences and applying it to my clients' daily activities. Um, When I started my business, Blair, I didn't have any assistance. I didn't have a coach. I didn't have a mentor. I just basically opened up the doors, put my shingle outside of my door, and expected people to walk in my business. Mm. I was basically sprung and reality hit my face. I was broke, Blair, after like month two. I couldn't even afford to buy my tax software. So from my personal experiences and from my clients' experiences, I realized that, you know what, hey, you know, we need a little bit more guidance. We need someone that's going to be honest and hold us accountable for what we desire. And Mm -hmm. I didn't have that. So I attribute a lot of my success to, one, exposing to my clients the truth, basically saying, hey, this is what it is. This is apples. This is oranges. This is your options. You know, this is the outcome and so forth. Um, But then I also let them know, hey, like, you're responsible for this. Like, if I even do it, if I teach you, if I know everything about your business more than you, you are still 100% responsible. So I take the responsibility off me, and I also put that on my client. Um, And I think that's one of the main reasons why I've been able to achieve the success that I have there was simply because it's not my responsibility to do everything pertaining to your accounting. You have to meet me halfway. Right, right. I think that's huge. If you're just tuning in, this is Blair Durham with Black Wall Street Today. We're with Ms. Falashide Ayabusi out of Largo, Maryland. Um, She is an accountant. In fact, she's the accountant to entrepreneurs. And so she's told us a little bit about her story. And now I kind of I'm hoping we can get into some of the nuts and bolts. Right. What are some of the best practices that you teach? We have a, uh, a number of entrepreneurs that listen to this show every week. What are what are some of the things that the tools of the trade that you provide in your business? Oh, well, that discipline first there. Uh, yeah. What I realized, and I'm just realizing this, honestly, after seven years being in an entrepreneur myself and 16 years in the accounting industry, mm-hmm. I just realized this two months ago. Uh, the first thing that we need to incorporate is the discipline. 
um, accounting requires you to be disciplined and say, hey, I'm going to send my accountant this paperwork. I'm going to review my financial statements. I'm going to check my bank account every day. So the first thing that I feel in my clients is that that discipline to, to be proactive uh, with their accounting. And I let them know, hey, if you're not proactive with your accounting, then this happens. Yeah. If you're not proactive with your accounting, you're not able to make these decisions. You understand? So I'm just... And I know you said a few things there. I want you to say those things again. You said looking at your business account daily. You also said um, financial statements monthly. You said ensuring that um, the documents are submitted to the accountant in a timely fashion. What were some of those other things? You said a few things. Um, I just want to make sure everyone heard that. Yeah, look... And then I kind of said indirectly too, Blair, so I apologize. Guys. No, this is good. Um, we're kind of putting them um, indirectly like that. But those that's where it starts, Blair. Like, if I cannot get them to be disciplined, mm-hmm. it's nothing I can do for them. Like, yeah. if I don't receive your financial, if I don't receive your bank statements within a timely manner, Blair, I cannot close out their books for the month and wow. give them the final data that they need for that month. So that discipline is the core. That accountability is the core of what allows me to achieve the success with my clients that I do. I put the stick to them, basically, where I say, hey, I need your help. You mm-hmm. need your help. We yeah. need you. I love it. So um, discipline and accountability say, sound like they're they're two sides of the same coin. What else are you teaching? By way of best also, practices. I'm teaching, yeah, so one of the best practices I'm teaching that business is a major puzzle. You cannot just focus on sales. You cannot just focus on marketing. You cannot just focus on making your brand look beautiful there. You have to focus on every part of your business, kind of simultaneously, Mm -hmm. but using the numbers to make your final decisions and to give you the reality and true picture of it. So my goal is to really teach entrepreneurs that, you know, your accounting is supposed to be used in conjunction with your sales, in conjunction with your market efforts in conjunction with building your brand. And without the financial data, you really don't know what's working. Wow. I'm going to ask you to say that again. (laughs) Without the financial data. So if you're not utilizing your accounting in conjunction with every other aspect of your business, then you can't say for sure if you're having success or not. Exactly. How well your business is doing in every area. And I think, honestly, Blair, that is the reason why the small business failure rate is at the 90% that it is. And probably even higher for the black community um, exactly. without having had the benefit of this kind of, of training. I love it. I love it. Is there another best practice? Uh, well, another best practice is basically I want us to claim everything. Like, in the African-American community, Blair, and you've probably heard this, you know, grandpa, somebody talking on fringes, random talk conversation, where the person say, I just started my business, mm-hmm. and somebody say, oh, well, you know, try to make sure you collect majority cash or try to make sure, you know, you know, you don't you know, report this. I really want us African-American entrepreneurs specifically to understand that for every dollar that you do not include, and this is cash that I'm talking about, and, you know, your PayPal, your, your cash apps, right? Mm-hmm. All of the cash that you guys try to hide from IRS is the cash your business needs to show the bank that they're making and that you have a valuable and profitable and scalable business. So the most African-American businesses, because they are not uh, uh, comfortable uh, exposing the truth about their finances in terms of, oh, I'm collecting majority cash and I'm not claiming it, they don't realize that this is probably the reason why they're unable to get that loan because the business on paper doesn't show that you make enough. Mm-hmm. And that's like, huge. What I realized because we struggle in the com- area of bankability, right? And exactly. so you're saying that part of the reason why that's the case is we're hiding, we're hiding the business's revenue. Exactly, we're hiding the business revenue, and we don't have the core financials to show the actual growth. Mm. So not able to demonstrate growth. I'm taking notes here. I always take notes during my shows. I, I learn so much. This is great. This is great. Is there another? 
<laughs> well, let me just say this. If, you, if you're just tuning in, uh, Blair Durham here with Black Wall Street today. Um, Miss Falasha Day Ayabusi is joining us from Largo, Maryland. Um, and we're having just a fascinating conversation about best practices with regard to accountancy and entrepreneurship. Um, she's given us some, some nuggets here. So what else do you have? We're eating good. Yeah. Okay. So let's continue to keep eating them. So <laughs> <laughs> in, in our community, right, Blair? Yeah. I well, and it's so funny that I come on the show today. So the other day, I'm sitting, at, I'm watching, and I'm always um, doing research. And so I posted on my Facebook page, "Do you all know where money come from?" And so I conclusively learned that I have to go get my economics degree because I just learned that for every time the U.S. produce money, we mm-hmm. produce a death. Mm-hmm. Every time. And so I had to take that even further, Blair. I said, okay, well, if the bank is able to produce a death every time that they issue money, right? Mm -hmm. Then every time they issue us money, right, the debt amount is higher. So what does that mean? So that means that there's no rhyme or reason or benefit for any bank to give us any money at all for small businesses. So our chances are saying, okay, you know, we thought it was just an African-American problem, like, oh, banks don't want to give out a loan, but there's no incentive behind giving business loans there. And so, like, I want us businesses to understand that we cannot rely on um, getting bank loans or investors or venture, venture capitalists because in all actuality, they're not looking for us. They're not looking for our brand to be successful. We have to make our brand successful so they can come and look for us. So I want us to stop looking for the handouts or stop trying to get a loan and focus on building a core, profitable, scalable business. And then guess what? When you don't need the money, they're going to come knock on your door. When your brand is popping, they're going to try to offer you money. When they see that you are uh, uh, worthy of their sponsorship, you're going to get it. So I just want us to go out and push it to the limit, Blair. Push it to there's no return. And say, you know what? If they don't want me, they're going to see me. That's beautiful. And so is this now, I know that's a little bit different than probably what your core business is in terms of the accountancy. Are you also teaching entrepreneurs how to structure these uh, sustainable businesses, how to scale their businesses so that they will begin yep. to attract those sponsors, those um, those investors? Yes, I do. I don't do it directly for them to attract investors. I do it so they can build a scalable business. Because I was one of those businesses there that I didn't have all of my systems in place. Sure. So around 2016, I had to basically downsize my office, cut back my staff, fire over 100K plus of clients, to be able to restructure and rebuild my business. So from that experience of me just basically getting, honing into my craft and finding my niche, I yeah. realized I cannot help a person if I don't tell them those things, such as uh, putting systems in place, or doing this, or uh, reading personal development books, because it's all collective. Yes, it is. Like, I like I realized as, a, as their accountant that the less my client reads on the forefront, the less they understand their finances on the back or the less inclined or interested they are. So it's a ripple effect. Like, I try to expose full level of entrepreneurship with our clients. Mm-hmm. Huge. And and do you have a focus really on on empowering black entrepreneurs or um, do you work with a larger, larger population? Yeah, no, actually, honestly, I do work with the larger population, but my primary focus is African-American-based businesses. Um, And the reason being is because I personally believe that this is our gateway to economic freedom. Absolutely. There is no cap. There is no door saying you cannot bust through that door. Your future is basically at your hand. So I feel like if I can push more entrepreneurs there to do their accounting, to manage their books, put in the systems, um, read their financial statements, um, that they can now employ more individuals. They can give back to their community. They can now hire more interns or become a mentor for their community. I feel like everything that I'm doing for our African-American entrepreneurs has a direct correlation to the success of their community. 
huge. You and I share that. I certainly want to uh, <laughs> commend you on, on your work and just uh, I'm looking forward, hopefully, to ways that we can partner in person. I'm super excited. So but before, because we've got just a couple minutes left, talk to our audience about exactly what your scope of work is. Like, I know that a lot of folks who you know specialize in accounting are also teaching classes. They're um, they're utilizing social media, et cetera, to get the word out about their services. What is what is your sort of scope of work? Just as we're wrapping up. Okay, so first of all, I have to let you guys know, Blair, like we're on a mission to save 100,000 businesses a trillion dollars. Okay. When we save that trillion dollars in five years, Congress and the government, they want to come look for Falasha Day. They want to come look mm-hmm. for me because our clients will have more savings in their bank account. They're going to be able to employ people. I feel like uh, the reason why the core of what we're trying to do is basically reduce the small business failure rate, but encompassing that strong literacy, financial literacy, and that financial management in conjunction to all that's required of entrepreneurship. So well, Asha like, Day, are you are you limited to working with business owners in Maryland though? Oh no, no. So I have clients that are in um, Texas and Florida, New okay. Jersey, Philadelphia, like literally Blair, all over the United States of America. Got it. We've got two minutes um, remaining. Tell the audience yes. how you can be reached. How can we find you? How can we connect with the work that you're doing? Okay, so you guys can find me on all things social media, Falasha Day, F-O-L-A-S-A-D-E, The Accountant, or uh, Instagram, Facebook, everywhere. You can also go and subscribe to my mailing list at bit.ly forward slash Falasha Day TV. And then also go and um, find me on Facebook and, and, you know, follow me and watch my live streams. I try to empower us, you know, almost every other day, Blair. So I would love... Um, for you guys to follow me on social media. Okay, perfect. And I'll make sure I share that to our platforms as well. Felicia Day, this has been so great. Again, I, I look forward to not only having you back on the show, but perhaps having you in our market to do a training. This is fantastic. I want to thank you so much for your time today. No, Blair, thank you for having me. We'll talk soon. This week's hashtag add this to the list is brought to you by Hereby Aisha at 757-816-6297. That's Hereby Aisha for all your hair care and styling needs. Elegant Occasions Unlimited, mobile styling and formal wear. Latricia and Chris Letzinger, you need it, they've got it. From bridal consulting to cotillions, um, everything you need formal for men, women and children, mobile www.elegantoccasionsunlimited.com Also, hashtag add this to the list. T2 Fitness with Tasha Turnbull presents the Ultimate Nutrition Starter Guide. It's designed to help you develop the foundation and positive relationship with food you'll need in order to lose weight. Create flavorful and diversified meals you eat inside the house as well as how to eat healthy while on the go and maintain that weight loss regardless of your busy schedule. What's included? A downloadable nutrition weight loss workshop for you to view at your leisure, as well as a physically and mentally prepping for weight loss ebook with grocery list, meal choices, seasoning choices, 10 of Tasha's favorite recipes and 20 snack choices. And last but not least, prepping for weight loss private Facebook group with additional recipes, meal choices, product recommendations, and questions answered by the expert herself. Congratulations on this launch, both uh, Latricia and Chris, as well as Tasha. Our very next guest is Miss Bola Sakumbi. She has a unique distinction of saving her first $100,000 in just over three years with a starting salary of only $54,000 before taxes, juggling a mortgage and other expenses. Her company, Clever Girl Finance, offers affordable plans to help women learn about money while holding them accountable to reach their financial goals. How are you, Bola? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's an honor to have you. I'd like to delve right in and start talking about your story. I almost broke down reading the front page of your website. Please share with our listeners, what's your background? How is it that you came to get involved in this work? Yes, definitely. So I am originally from Nigeria. I came from a traditional home. My parents were, my dad was working class and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And as I got older and 
started to observe my mom, I realized that she was experiencing things that she didn't like. So she had gotten married at 19, had four kids, didn't go to college. And as she started to go in her marriage, she started to see friends of hers either get divorced or lose their spouses, unfortunately, and they would be left with nothing. And so my mom took it upon herself um, that after she had me, I was her last child, that she was going to go to college and empower herself to be able to contribute to our family. Mm. So she did that, um, got pushed back from my dad because he also had come from this traditional background of the man is going to take care of his family. So she did that. Um, Fast forward several years, my family went through a financial downturn when my father had to retire about 15 years earlier than he planned. And in the grand scheme of someone's retirement planning, 15 years is a huge deal. (laughs) So um, about that same time, it was time for me to go to college. And my dad was like, I can either afford to pay for my retirement or I can afford to pay to send you to college. I'm going to pick my retirement. So my mom was like, well, I'm going to send you to college as an opportunity and as a privilege. It's not your right, but I'm going to do this for you because I want to set you up to succeed and I will pay for your college education and, you know, take take a risk on or take a chance on putting my own retirement plans aside by supporting you right. and I will do that for you in cash. So my mom paid for my college education, went into college, graduated, and coming out of college, I realized that, you know, huge opportunity that my mom had given to me. I got my first job earning about $54,000 um, before taxes, and that was more money than I'd ever earned in my life. And I just wanted to make my family proud. So I put my head down to the ground, and I started to figure out, how do I save money? How do I invest? And I you know, I made mistakes, but I figured it out, and I was able to save over $100,000, like you said, in the three and a half years after college. And so as time progressed, you know, getting older, mm-hmm. getting married, having my own baby, you know, looking at my own face, I started to see the things that my mom was observing at the same, at that time with her own friends of divorces and single parenthood and moving spouses and things like that. And I felt really compelled to start something that I was passionate about, which is personal finance for women, to help empower other women to do well with their money, to provide them with the resources that I wished I had when I was trying to figure out how to save. There are not a lot of women or even women of color talking about money at the time when I was figuring out this myself. And so that's where Clever Girl comes from. It's from the, you know, the passion to empower and motivate women like me to succeed with their finances because we are capable of financial success. Bola, beautiful. (laughs) Absolutely (laughs) love it. If you just tuned in, this is Blair Durham with Black Wall Street Today. We're with Miss Bola Sakumbi, who has a phenomenal story of how she learned to save money. And now she's empowering women, I assume, all over the world to do the same. And I want to kind of get right into this. Let's talk about what that looked like. Uh, What was your plan um, when you started to reach your personal savings goal? How'd you do it? What is it that you're teaching others? So... You mean, what am I teaching other people now, or how did I save? Well, let's, if they're the same, then, <laughs> but if, okay. if they're a little different, then let's start okay. with, let's start with how you did it. I mean, because I think that's, okay. that's empowering. Yeah. So similar, yeah. But in terms of, you know, my personal story, like I said, when I came out of college, I wanted to make my family proud. This was the most money I'd ever made. And so I didn't know that I wanted to save $100,000. That was a huge amount. But I I knew that I wanted to save as much as possible. Okay. And so the first thing I did was I got that first job and I went to orientation and the lady at HR said, you know, there's something called a 401k. It's a retirement savings plan and we're going to give you free money. Mm -hmm. As soon as I heard the word free money, ding, 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 (laughs) the alarm bells went off. I was like, you know what, I'll take the free money. And then I decided, okay, there's this thing called a 401k. I have to go figure out what this thing is but I started researching the 401k and then as I was researching it I stumbled upon a number of blogs um, by other women in the personal finance space that were pursuing early retirement at the time they were 99% male (laughs) nobody that looked like or sounded like me but they were all intent on pursuing early retirement I was like wait a minute there's so much I can learn from these people and so I started to learn about budgeting about investing about retirement planning and along the path I stumbled into a bookstore and I picked picked up a book by another male author called Smart Women Finish Rich by David Bach and I read that book from cover to cover. Give us the book title until, once more. 
It's called Smart Women Finish Rich by David Back. Smart and, Women um, Finish Rich. Okay. Got yes. it. And I read that book from cover to cover until it was literally in shreds. And wow. I basically figured out what I needed to do. So first thing first, I started contributing to my retirement plan. I didn't max it out immediately mm-hmm. because I was still trying to figure out my budget. But I started contributing. And over the next couple of years, I was able to max it out. Um, I focused on keeping my expenses as low as possible. Because okay. if there is one thing that you want to do to build wealth, it is to spend less than you earn. Mm-hmm. And so after I paid my mortgage, my insurance, phone bill, car note, um, I got lean and mean with my budget. I was getting to work early, going through the conference room, getting the free breakfast. I would show up at bridal showers or birthday or baby showers at work and be like, hey, congratulations, what's your lunch? Um, I was buying ramen noodles for the <laughs> I just got what you said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're showing up at folks' events for your meals. I got you. Some of us are doing that anyway. But anyway, go ahead. (laughs) Because now sometimes offices will like feel... They will like schedule conferences or like surprise parties. And there's and always extra food at events. So I yep. think that's wise. Yep. Okay. What else? <laughs> so I also focus on saving 40 to 50% of each paycheck and anything extra. So that meant that when I got a tax return, I was saving that. If I got a raise, like a 2% raise or a 3% raise, I would mm-hmm. pretend like I never got it. I would divert that money into savings. And then as I started to make progress in my savings, I realized that all the other people who are pursuing this early retirement were increasing their income. I started as thinking well. about okay. ways. Yes, yes, increasing your income. So I started thinking about ways that I could increase my own income at the time. And I was like, well, what are things that I like to do? And I like taking pictures. I was always taking pictures of my friends. So I started a side hustle, the photography business. Mm-hmm. And I put an ad on Craigslist at the time. I don't think anybody uses that anymore. I know, right? <laughs> and <laughs> everybody has perfect. integrated a platform to sell stuff. So yes. it's like, oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So I put up that first ad. I did my first wedding for free. Um, second wedding for maybe like 200 bucks. And they mm-hmm. gave me a tip of $100. Yeah, I saw that. What was um, it? Within your first year, you 40 grand in photography? Yes. Oh, my so goodness. the first year, I earned $10,000. And then the second year, I earned about $30,000 from doing wow. wedding photography. Um, and I saved all of that, too. So a combination of all of those things um, really helped me to save that $100,000. And sometimes it was really difficult because at the time, you know, young, 20-something, um, I had friends who were working on Wall Street making mm-hmm. my entire year salary in a single bonus. Mm. And, you know, they wanted they wanted to go hang out. They wanted to go on vacation. They wanted to go buy the Louis Vuitton handbags. And I'm like, guys, I can't afford to. And if I did it, it would be in debt. And it was kind of difficult because I would get the, oh, why are you being so cheap? Oh, YOLO. How are you ever going to save that much money? But as I ever, as I started getting closer to $100,000, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe really I'm doing close. this. Right. And then I got to $100,000 and I was like, oh my God, if I could do this, I could do anything. And I started to tell my friends, guys, guess what? I was able to save a hundred grand. And they were like, wait a minute, how did you do it? You need to tell us. So, um, one of the really important things, you know, that's how I did it, but in terms of like what I teach and what I share with my audience and this clever finance, it's, you know, one of the big factors outside of the money skills, like this is step by step how to save, how to invest, how to pay off debt, et cetera. One of the key elements is empowering women to understand that they are capable to succeed. Cause a lot of so times let's, so let's pause. Own. Let's pause. I want to yes. kind of recap these first things before you go into, because I love this. So first, if you've just tuned in, uh, Blair Durham here with Black, Black Wall Street today. Um, we have, we're just fortunate to have Miss Bola Sokumbi with us. She is the founder of the Clever Girls Finance Platform, and she figured out at a very young age how to save $100,000. Just to recap, I got three nuggets here. First, we were looking at blogs about um, pursuing an early retirement, right? So you started learning about budgeting, investing, etc. You read the book Smart Women Finish Rich from cover to cover several times. Um, you started contributing to your 401k and you maxed it out. You figured out and you mastered the art of spending less than you earn by doing things like crashing parties. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> I'm not going to hold that against you, right? I've crashed a party or two in my day. Okay, so then 40 to 50% 
of each of your paychecks and anything extra, like a tax return, anything like that. You figured out how to save. You pretended like you never got a raise, uh, contributed all that to your savings. And then you worked on increasing your income as well. So you started doing something part-time, made tons of money in photography. That's your personal story. Now, please talk to us about how you're empowering other women to do the same thing. You were going to say something. Yeah, you were so, saying the yeah. first part is with the mindset. <laughs> what is it? Yeah, so it's recognizing that we are capable of saving. And I think sometimes we are, some, you know, we could be our own worst enemies, especially if we have never accomplished something. Mm-hmm. So for me personally, um, I had never imagined myself being $100,000. I was making, after taxes, my salary was forty k, And sitting down with my friends, you know, half of them were like, oh, that sounds cool. You do it and tell me, tell us how you do it. And the other half were like, girl, are you crazy? Nobody can do that. You only make forty k after taxes, please. I can't Stop figure out how you did it. I'm, I'm just baffled. <laughs> I mean, even with you just giving me the nuggets of how you did it, I'm still like... So go ahead. So first, the recognition, no, we can do this, okay? You can do this, and it's about um, just once you've gotten that into your head, you have to come up with a reason why you want to succeed is what it is that you want to succeed at because... For that reason why. It's not going to be your why. It's Mm -hmm. not going to be a walk in the park. So when I walked over those steps of what I did, it of how I did it, it sounded like, oh, this is super easy. Yes, you just did one, two, three, four, and $100,000. Mm-hmm. But the truth of the matter is that... <laughs> <laughs> no way, no it how. Was, I mean, there's no. six numbers in $100,000. Like, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Go ahead. It was really, it was really, really difficult. There were times where I went out and bought stuff and I went back to return it. There were times when I mm. felt really, really bad because I felt like I was cheap. I felt like I couldn't do what my friends are doing I felt like you know like who am I to even succeed like you know like why do I even think I'm capable of doing this but I went back to my why and I went back to the fact that my parents gave up so much for me I went back to the fact that this is more money than my mother had ever made but she still put me through college and I went back to the fact that I wanted to make my mother proud you know because that was the one thing she told me she said I'm going to do this for you but you have to promise me that you're going to do well in your life and I always thought about that so knowing your why is super important and then the next thing is surrounding yourself with the people who are going to motivate and empower you Mm -hmm. this is where the platform comes in right so you're developing this community alongside it okay Go ahead, keep going. So this is how I, I learn. That. I learn by talking. So <laughs> if I don't say it back to you, I probably didn't get it. So go ahead. That's a great recap, though. <laughs> um, so <laughs> for me at the time, you know, when I was starting out saving money, a lot of my friends were trying to figure it out too, and I found my space. I found my community in those online blogs, even though they were by people I couldn't relate to. They were mostly written by white men. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And that was fine. I realized that, wait a minute, as I started to make progress and learn more and find other friends who were like-minded, like, we were motivating each other. Mm -hmm. And it takes me back to a quote that I once read, and it was like, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. Mm -hmm. And you are the average of the five people that you surround yourself with. And there was one more quote where it says, you never want to be the smartest person in the Mm -hmm. room because once you are that smartest person and you start to get comfortable in that space. Mm -hmm. And so if you're listening and you're in any of those spaces, then it's time to shift that circle of influence and find your tribe of people who are going to empower you when you say, I'm only making 40K, but I want to save 100K. And they'll say, yes, girl, you can do that. Let's talk about how to create a plan. So the... The mindset piece, the motivation, the empowerment, uh, especially as we go through the motions, right? Mm -hmm. When you first set a goal, it's exciting. Like, we're getting into the new year. Everyone's going to be setting these amazing finance and weight loss and life goals. It's going to be like, yay, awesome. I'm going to, 2019 is going to be my best year ever. (laughs) And then as time progresses, the novelty of that goal setting wears off. Yeah, by like, January 20th or so, it's just... Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I live in New Jersey. By the time the first snowstorm hits next month, people are going to be like, you know what? I can't do this. What was me? This year sucks. I'm just going to go back to my comfort zone. Right, And right. when you get into that space, you need you need to have the right motivators. You need to have the right supporters. And that's your mindset. And that's the people you surround yourself with. So in addition to the skills of learning how to, you know, improve your finances, you also have to work on yourself. Mm-hmm. 
that's really key to the success with your development. I love it. So for those that may have just turned on their radios, this is Black Wall Street Today. I'm Blair Durham. Um, right now, we have the pleasure of speaking with Miss Bola Sakumbi, um, who is giving us just some very practical ways to learn to save lots of money. We've got about four minutes left. She has founded the Clever Girl Finance platform. Um, and I want you to walk us through, kind of without talking costs, tell us what your plan consists of. So what do we get when we sign on as as a member? Yeah, so when you join Clever Girl Finance, you get access to our course platform. So we have a course platform where we're delivering new courses every single month, and our courses cost uh, cover topics from core financial education like investing, saving, budgeting, paying off debt to life-related courses that are tied to your finances. So I'm getting married. How do I plan a wedding on a budget? I'm having Good. a baby. How do I just buy finances? I'm getting divorced. I want to start a business. All these different topics are mm-hmm. course content that we have created or in the process of creating. You also get access to um, videos, worksheets. Um, we have a live monthly coaching call where anybody in the community can tune in live, ask questions, engage with other women who are on the same path, and basically have a great time, have fun. And you also get access to our private community where you can go in at any time and request an accountability partner, network, network with the other women, and just share your soul, share how you're feeling in a safe and comfortable space. Um, and that's really important because a lot of times we are in spaces where we can't talk with people around us about money because we're embarrassed and we're ashamed. And our community is a no judgment, no shame zone, no stupid questions. It's all about support and motivation. So that's what's included with um, our plan, community accountability, monthly calls and amazing financial education. I love it. Please let folks know we've got just a minute left. How can we reach you um, if we're interested in in connecting? Absolutely. You can find me on the website, clevergirlfinance.com. And of course, on Instagram at clevergirlfinance. Clevergirlfinance. Oh, Bola, this has been an honor. Um, I definitely would love to have you back on the show. Um, as I said to our first guest, I would love to have you come to our market and do some training. So I'm certainly going to be looking for a future collaboration. I hope the feeling is mutual. <laughs> I would love that. I would, this is such an honor. I'm, I'm so humbled and grateful. Thank you. And I would, I would definitely love that. Yes. Fantastic. Thanks so much. We'll talk soon. Thank you very much. Bye. You're welcome. And last but not least, we are remembering Mr. Aubrey Stone. He is the founder, was the founder and CEO of the California Black Chamber of Commerce. He passed away on November 28th at the age of 74 years old. According to uh, his friends and family, he fought tirelessly to secure economic opportunities for African-Americans throughout the state and beyond. And now after a long battle with cancer, he is at rest. Affectionately referred to by many as Stoney, he was a formidable champion for black entrepreneurs and was considered to be a giant in the small business community. While he was a native of Brooklyn, New York, his name was synonymous with California and he was a familiar face and voice at the state capitol. Quote, he was a pioneer and fierce advocate for minority business enterprise and for the black community. He championed equal opportunities in the private and public sectors and always talked about the need for better access to capital. According to the Los Angeles City Council member and former assembly member, uh, Kern Price, Aubrey Stone was a fierce, unapologetic supporter of all things black. He was our champion. Stone, along with five others, created the California Black Chamber of Commerce in 1995 with the mission of providing programs and services to strengthen black ownership and business opportunities throughout the state. The Black Chamber of Commerce Foundation also operates radio station KDEE 97.5 FM. Uh, He was also the founder and president of A. Stone & Associates, a corporate diversity training firm designed to improve communications for increased productivity and to break down uh, stereotypes. Rest in peace, Mr. Aubrey Stone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Stay with us online at Black Wall Street Today on Facebook and Black Wall Street Today on Instagram. And then follow us on Twitter as well at BWS Today. We look forward to talking again next week. Have a wonderful week.
I have said and I will continue to say that the most important priority for the black community is the black community, not a particular political party. <laughs>